Hello everyone. Welcome to a quick video on how to use Hyper-V and Hyper-V Manager. This is Kevin Remdy and I'm an IT Pro Evangelist with Microsoft and just wanted to record a quick example of how easy it is to get started with Hyper-V running either on Windows 8 as I'm doing here or even on Windows Server 2012. Uh, it's really the same, uh, the interface is the same as far as the simple creation of virtual machines and getting started with Hyper-V. So what I'm going to do is, uh, here I have the Hyper-V Manager. Um, you see I have a number of virtual machines already configured in my environment. This will, of course, for your list, when you're starting out, will be empty. Uh, you'll have a connection to your local machine here. And on the right-hand side, you have the actions where I can create a new virtual machine. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to quickly install Windows Server 2012. Uh, just a quick evaluation copy as a new virtual machine here. So I'm going to walk through this very simple wizard to do that. So I'm going to call this one first server VM and uh, I can choose where that virtual machine is going to be stored. I happen to have a folder, um, actually you have a drive or a folder or location, wherever you want to put it where you have uh, some additional space, uh, some available space. I'm going to put it on my D drive here. Um, startup memory, well the memory for the virtual machine. This is actual physical memory of your computer that's going to be used for running this virtual machine. So running this server I'm going to say I'm going to take uh, since I do have quite a bit of memory available in this box, I'll go ahead and use 2 gig of available RAM. And I'm going to say use dynamic memory. And uh, make sure you look up dynamic memory, and we're going to be talking about it during our series this month. Dynamic memory being the ability to allow the virtualization layer to essentially manage memory for us and allocate or, or lessen the amount of memory being used by a virtual machine based on its need and based on the needs of other machines on the same physical virtualization host connection? Well, we, we uh, define virtual switches and then we can define those connections. For example, if I want this machine to be connected to the outside world and use my physical NIC, I've defined a virtual switch named external and I'm going to make a connection uh, by default with one NIC configured in this new machine. We can add additional network interface cards, virtual ca network cards essentially, to these virtual machines. But when you're starting out building a new virtual machine, you'll have that one NIC and you can make a connection or you can choose to connect it at some later point. Create a virtual hard disk. The VHD or VHDX, as they're now known, a new new, new format, uh, is created for a virtual machine, or I can use an existing one, or maybe I decided to attach one later. Well, I'm going to go ahead and allow this to name my virtual hard disk the same name as my machine name and give it the VHDX extension, so it's the new style virtual hard disk file. Um, I'll go ahead and say that that machine is going to see a disk of 127 gig available. Now the nice reality is here, it's not actually going to be that big. That file will start out very small and grow as needed. So even though the machine believes it has that much space, um, it's actually going to start out at um, a very small file size, uh, which is that nice aspect of dynamic disks. And all, now, do I need to install an operating system? Well, yes, this is a machine that basically has a blank hard disk, and so at some point I'm going to need to install something to run. Now, I, what I'm going to do, notice I can install from a floppy disk or from a network-based installation server, but I'm going to install from an ISO file. So that's an ISO image of a DVD image, um, and I happen to have downloaded the evaluation of Windows Server 2012, so I'm going to browse to that location. I happen to have it on my F drive. I believe I have an ISOs folder here. And there it is. So I'll go ahead and just select that ISO file to be mounted as if it were a bootable DVD disk when this machine starts up for the first time, so I can do that installation. And that's it. Click Finish. And now I have a new first server VM. Well, since I know I have a, a DVD in the drive, essentially, I'm going to go ahead and start that machine. And as I'm starting it, I can also double-click here, or we can use the Connect and uh, connect will allow me then to connect to that virtual machine. Oh, I think I did it twice here. Let's see. Here we go. There it is. Now as you're working with virtual machines, you do have the option also to view these in full screen and that makes it a lot easier um, if your screen real estate is, is limited or you want to uh, uh, basically just interact with one machine. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here so we can see this a little bit better. I'm going to just get through this installation so that we can uh, talk about some other things while the operating system is actually being deployed. All right, um, so let's go ahead and choose to install Data Center Edition with a GUI. We'll go all out graphical user interface Data Center Evaluation Edition. Accept the license terms, of course, read them carefully. <laughs> 
Um, and this is not an upgrade in this case, it's a fresh install. So I'm just going to go ahead and say install Windows only. It finds the available disk that we have that's not yet formatted, but it'll do all the for formatting and partitioning of this, this virtual hard disk drive for us, just like you're installing on a physical box. And there we go. So the installation is taking place. Now while that's running, let me uh, restore this down again, just kind of get this out of the way and let that continue in the background. And I want to walk you through a couple of different um, items with regard to Hyper-V and its configuration. A couple of different areas to, to note in the actions area here. We can create new virtual machines, new virtual hard disks, or even virtual floppy disks. Um, importing virtual machines. So if we have a virtual machine that is available to be imported as a, as a copy of one that's been running on a different platform or we've exported it in the past, uh, we can either, in the, either case now, we don't have to have previously exported. That's a new feature of Server 2012 Hyper-V um, and, and this new version that's in Windows 8. Uh, we could actually import a non-exported machine as long as we had all the files in place. Um, Hyper-V settings. Here's where we configure things such as our default locations for virtual hard disks and the virtual machine images. We can configure non-uniform memory addressing, options around storage migration, and these options are actually different on Windows 8 and Windows Server based Hyper-V. Windows 8 doesn't have the ability to do live machine migrations. It can do live storage migration, but on the server you'll see some additional options here around live migration and replication, and that configuration for this particular virtualization host for those functionalities. Options around keyboard use, the uh, mouse release key, um, if you need to release the mouse from the virtual machine you're working in. Um, typically you don't have to do that on new op newer operating systems that are virtualization aware. And reset any other choices around different options we've had in Hyper-V. And let's see how our installation is going. Ah, we're getting there. Uh, virtual switches. This is where we manage networking. And as I mentioned, we can associate networks external type, internal, and private. I won't go into the details of that here, um, but it's something to investigate further when you start thinking about how these machines are going to communicate with one another or with the outside world. As I mentioned, I have an external defined named uh, network switch, virtual switch, that is associated with my physical NIC on this piece of hardware. And so this is how we would then make that connection to the outside world. But I could as easily have created something uh, called a private network, in which case I have a named network where the virtual machines that all share this same connection or share a connection to the same virtual switch uh, by this given name will actually be able to see each other. Um, in the case of private, the host physical box can't see these virtual machines or connect to them at all, whereas an internal, the, the host can actually participate. Okay. So managing virtual switches, managing virtual storage. So we actually have now new functionality around creating uh, virtual fiber channel connections to fiber channel storage. Editing, editing and inspecting disks. So if we have a hard disk file that's been having problems or uh, maybe a, comp a compression that we want to do, some save some space on a disk that's dynamic uh, or maybe change the type of disk it is. There's a number of different tools available here, stopping services and so on. And then finally, in the settings of, of a virtual machine itself, we can make modifications on adding hardware. Now, some of these options are going to only be available when your machine is not running. So I can't, for example, right now add a new network adapter, uh, but I could if the machine was stopped. I can, however, add hard disks uh, to a virtual SCSI controller even while the machine is running. So that is something we could do. Uh, we can manage options around the uh, the BIOS. So what's the boot order for these virtual devices? Is the NumLock turned on? We can configure memory. Remember I, uh, remember I enabled dynamic memory and we can configure options around that. Once I've enabled dynamic memory, I can even make changes to this while the machine is running. So my machine is going to start out with the 2 gig that I said, but it could actually be reduced as far as 512 meg or up to available memory that's on my system. Processors. So as long as the virtual processors uh, or the physical processors I have can support this, I can increase the number of virtual processors for that machine um, in order to get more processing power. IDE controllers, DVD drive, there's the mounted ISO file that we're doing our installation from, which looks like it's getting right along there. SCSI controllers, as we showed there. And then the network adapters, and we could add additional network adapters to a stop machine. We can make configuration changes such as hardware acceleration and advanced features around security and uh, router, such as, such as DHCP card and router advertisement card. 
managing uh, relationships to physical devices such as COM ports, diskette drives, and then management of the machine name and information about the machine, what integration services are enabled on the machine, snapshot locations, and actions for stopping and starting that happen automatically should the virtualization host shut down expected uh, in, a, uh, in a safe way. All right, so let's take another look at our virtual machine and see how we're coming along. Well, it looks like it's restarted and was just expecting to try to boot the DVD again, but we let that skip. So let's go ahead and see how we're doing. All right. So rather than go through this, you can see that we've done the installation. We're ready to set up a built-in administrator account. And when we want to work with that virtual machine, it's just as easy as double-clicking on it in order to open up a connection to it. Or if at some later point I've enabled remote desktop in that machine and uh, uh, set up administration on there, maybe set it up as a domain controller, connected other machines to that domain. We can do all of this now in virtualization and make a really powerful training and testing and then eventually production environment. And the benefit of running Windows 8 virtualization on uh, Hyper-V is that we can use our existing desktop, build a whole set of machines that can easily be managed and then port it into a, a data center environment using Hyper-V on a server, either Hyper-V on Windows Server 2012 or the free Hyper-V Server 2012. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this, this little Hyper-V primer was useful to you and that you will continue to follow us on our blogs and this series that we have going on in March 2013 on virtualization and server virtualization from Microsoft.